Dear people of God gathered here this morning, you can call me Moloch. Now I know that's not as fancy of a name as the Archangel Michael or Gabriel, with whom you are probably a lot more familiar. But make no mistake, I was there from the beginning. From the beginning when God created countless angels, vast angels, more than you could even imagine. From the beginning, things were created in perfection, beautiful. We worshiped God, we obeyed God, we did whatever he asked us to do, for that is our role as angels. But not everybody liked that. Not everybody wanted to have that opportunity to serve God all the time. And so there was an uprising in heaven. One that is barely even described in your scriptures because it's unspeakable. It's, but it was described by your apostle John as a war in heaven. A war between the angels. A clash. A fight. An awful, awful event. Again, not recorded in your scriptures because, well, you couldn't even wrap your minds around it. But suffice it to say, it left a lasting effect. Now keep in mind that that war was over before it started. Some people think that when, when they talk about the, the war between good and evil, that it's going to be an even fight. But <laughs> no, before it was even started, God was in control. He's the one who is able to put an end to Satan's power in no time flat. It's important we remember that. However, that doesn't mean that Satan stopped trying. Oh yes, he was defeated, but he was not down. And so he continues to hammer on the people of God. In fact, as he looked around God's creation, he said, What is most precious to God? What is most important to the Lord? What, where can I inflict the greatest pain to his heart? And he looked at creation. He knew that God had created it wonderfully. Beautifully with his hand. That he had knit it together like, like a master craftsman. And yet he saw who is the greatest of all the creation? His people. His children who he made in his own image. His children who each have echoes of the wonder, the majesty of Him. Some people might think that us angels are, are the, the highest level of creation, but no. It was God's people. And so Satan, Satan wanting to get back at God, desiring to punish God. Well, he attacked God's people. He attacked them right where he knew it would hurt. If you go back to your book of Genesis, you see early on he posed as a certain serpent. And he tricked the people, tricked Adam and Eve that they might distrust God. Distrust the beautiful creation he placed them in. They ate of that fruit. And oh how Satan snickered. Oh how Satan chided the Lord because he, his perfect creation was now corrupted. As you look through the pages of your scripture, you see that he was called the prince of the world. Because since then, he's continued to sow his awful events, the, the hate and the anger. He's continued to fill people's hearts with fear and despair. But he's only the prince of this world. Only the prince. He thought he had ownership by taking God's people, by corrupting his creation. But no. There's still only one owner, master creator and designer. The garden was a beautiful place. A place where Adam and Eve had everything they could ever want. Something that we really can't wrap our minds around today, and yet they were still led into sin. Satan continues to assault us, continues to try to lead us away. and I can't help but think about another location. Not nearly as plush and beautiful as that garden, but much more the place of the perfect battlefield out in the middle of a desert. See, God, as He looked on this creation and saw His people, He didn't want to leave His people to themselves, to death, to suffering. And so He made a promise way back in the garden. He said that He, one day, would crush the head of the serpent. 
Now lots of people have tried to guess what that meant through the years. But it certainly wasn't what they imagined. Because the king, when he came, when he came to confront the devil, he came as a baby in a manger. Almost every Sunday school child who's ever been to Sunday school knows the story. A little baby born in Bethlehem. Born to two normal people. A couple named Mary and Joseph. Oh, how I wish I would have been there that night to sing glory to God in the highest and peace to His people on earth. And yet, while I was not there, Satan was. Satan knew who this king was even more than his own parents. And so he said to himself, how can I stop this king before he gets started? Well, you may remember the name King Herod. King Herod, stirred up by the devil, sought the lives of, of many children, little boys, two years and younger, trying to keep hold of his throne. What he didn't realize is the whole time he was serving Satan, not himself. So that little boy grew up though. And it's not my place to tell you the stories of his childhood or the stories of the things that happened. Although I, I, I know that one of the stories you know of where he was one time in the temple and, and even then people saw that he taught with authority. That was about when he was 12 years old. But today on the battlefield, he was in a desolate place. He was in the middle of the desert. And the devil wanting to defeat the key to our salvation confronted Jesus. Because he knew, he knew if he, could, if he could tempt Jesus away from following the Father fully, he would win. He wouldn't just be prince of this world, but king of this creation. And oh, oh what a king he would think he would be. And so there were many of us there that day. But we were silent. We weren't allowed to step in. This was a battle between Jesus and Satan. Jesus had been in the desert for 40 days. 40 days. He, he hadn't eaten a thing. And just so you're clear, he was true man. And so he was hungry. He was thirsty. It wasn't just some kind of, well, he's God, so he doesn't get hungry or thirsty. No, he had those same pains in his stomach that you feel when you're hungry. And so the devil mockingly walks up to me and says, Son of man, son of man, go ahead. Turn these stones into bread. Unfortunately for the devil, Jesus knew better. Jesus knew and he said to him, confronted him with the word of Scripture. Man does not live by bread alone. Man does not live on the temporal earthly things. Sure, we put a lot of stock in these temporal earthly things. A house over our head, a food on our tables, things like that. But God said, put me first. Put him first and all the rest of these things will fall into place. Perhaps not as we expect, but in his way and in his time. So when the devil was not able to tempt Jesus that first time, he again comes to him. He lobs his second grenade. He says, son of man. Now, it, just so you're clear, well, he said those words, he certainly didn't mean them as a term of respect. They were term, a term of derision. Son of man, and he took him up to the top of the temple, to the highest place. He said, jump off. And God's guardian angels will protect you. Now it is true that God will protect his people. That God sends his guardian angels to protect us. But God also says, do not put me to the test. God also says, do not put yourself in foolish, dangerous situations for no reason. That is testing him. And that's what Jesus' answer was. You shall not test the Lord your God. You shall not put him to the test. One more try. One more try. One last attempt. Satan again comes to Jesus, son of man. 
Look over this entire creation. Look over this entire place. I am the prince of this world. If you bow down and worship me, then it's all yours. Forgetting who the original owner was. And then, in only the way that Jesus could, he said so swiftly, Get behind me, Satan. Be gone. Get behind me and be gone. He was not about to fall for Satan's trips and traps. Tricks and traps. He was not about to give in to, the, to, to those ideas, those temptations that Satan had thrown at so many humans throughout history. And how true it is, isn't it? How many people bow to Satan, whether they know or not, for the sake of power. For the sake of, 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 of being the person who doesn't stand out at work. The person who's, well, not that strange Christian fella or lady. I know throughout history I've watched many Christians crumble. There was a king at the time of Jesus. His name was Caesar. And Caesar, he had a simple invitation to people. He said that if you will burn incense to me, then I'll leave you alone. I'll leave you alone. And, and now that might sound kind of strange, but the alternative was if you do not burn incense to Caesar, I will overtax you. I will make your life miserable and ultimately will take your life. Thousands upon thousands of Christians, they, their lives were taken. But even more bowed down. But I don't know if you knew this, but once in the person who is offered an oath is deceased. The oath is no longer held. It's null and void. The oath of Caesar that so many people took, that is no longer because Caesar is dead. And this is true for you all as well. Not the oath of Caesar, but the oath of Satan, who so many times has taken control, who has who's led you down the paths of temptation. His power is no more because of Jesus. Jesus in the battlefield that Satan thought he'd won gave his life for you and for me. Oh, it was a horrible, horrific day. You call it Good Friday, but it was a day where so many people cried and so much blood was spilled. And it wasn't just that day. It was the days leading up to it when Jesus was mocked and beaten and, and abandoned. And all this time he knew what was coming. And yet on the day you call Good Friday, he gave his life. And he defeated sin, death, and the devil. Many people, they look at Jesus' temptation and they, and they think to themselves, well, that must be the way that I can fight temptation. If I just read scripture at the devil, then the temptation will go away. How's that worked for you? Have you tried it before? Have you, have you been led to temptation and then started reading scripture? And Many Christians still give in to that temptation and then they feel all the guiltier because they weren't able to fight off the attacks of the devil. There's a better way. Because we have a victor. It is Christ. Christ who conquered the power of the devil. Christ who told Satan, be gone. Get behind me, Satan. Christ who is with each one of us every single day. Christ who is the one who can fight the attacks of the devil and win every single time. Christ who has been tempted like us in every way. And yet has never given in to sin. That is who your Savior is. That is who the Savior of the world is. And so when you are being tempted, when you feel overwhelmed by temptation, something you know that you should not do, don't turn to yourself. Turn to Jesus. For He is your hope and salvation. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we live in a world that is full of temptation. 
a world that we would just as soon turn our backs on you. Sometimes willingly, sometimes unwillingly. Lord, lead us instead of to look inside, to look to you. To look to you, for you are our strength and you are our healer. You are the one who confronted Satan and won. The one who hung on the tree at Calvary and declared victory once and for all. Lord, help us always look to your cross. Look to your cross, not as the torture device that it was, but as that victory sign for us as your people. Lead us always by your word, that we may have your strength, that we may know your truth, and that we may know your promise, that because you did indeed win, we will one day be with you forever. May this be our hope and our promise. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.